without any further delay. Um, so uh, morning, everyone. Um, thank you ever, going, ever so much again for, for taking the time to, to join us in this meeting. Um, the, the meeting today, the webinar is designing and deploying AI amazing teaching and learning approaches, and I'm hoping this will be the first of many University of London worldwide webinars. So if you have any feedback after the event, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, my name is Tim Hall. I'm a senior manager in the product innovation team at the University of London Worldwide. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the University of London Worldwide, we're an academic and professional services body that manages the distance and flexible learning programmes for our Federation members within the Federal University of London. So we have around 50,000 students in over 180 different countries around the world. Within the online education directorate led by Sam Brenton, the product innovation team sits, so it's the team I work for. Um, the product innovation team is led by Julia Leong Sun, and it's a relatively new team, uh, but we're tasked with leading on new program proposals, uh, existing program redevelopments, as well as enhancing the portfolio through implementation of new innovations, products, projects, practices within the University of London worldwide. Uh, one of those innovations is a new pilot project we've been working on, a partnership with Noodle Factory's Walter, which is an AI teaching assistant, and we're doing that on selected undergraduate and postgraduate law modules. Uh, many of you may have attended RIDE, uh, and I talked more, more, more in depth about it uh, then, but more than happy to speak to you uh, after the meeting. You've got my contact details. Um, our, our aim uh, with this particular pilot is to see if uh, integrating an AI system into our learning environment could enhance student engagement, improve performance and support our educators. So we, we plan to use Walter to manage FAQs, produce formative questions, supply quick personalised feedback to our students. Again, this is a very high overview, but if you're more interested in some a, a deeper dive, happy to discuss. Um, we're really confident that the pilot's going to help us gauge the potential benefits and suitability of this approach for, for wider application of our programmes um, and, and just generally really excited to see if this technology can provide kind of tangible benefits to our students and uh, indeed help our educators save valuable time. Uh, so now I've provided that context, I'd like you to uh, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Jim Wagstaff. Uh, Jim is uh, one of the co-founders of a Noodle Factory who we're working with, and his current research focuses on how universities harness the power of digital capabilities to best serve us uh, staff and students. Uh, Jim's going to talk today, as I've said, about teaching and learning approaches that include AI. Uh, the main aim of the webinar is to present ideas uh, and best practices relating to the design and deployment of courses using chat based learning uh, as a pedagogy. Um, you'll see that we have a Q&A open, uh, which I'll be checking throughout. Uh, we will have kind of break points to answer some of those questions. Uh, and for those of you who want to continue the discussion, like I said, we'll be providing contact information at the end of the session. So Jim, uh, over to you. Tim, thank you so much, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining on uh, on today. It's uh, it, my evening. I'm coming to you from Singapore, so it's great to join you in your morning, my evening. It's a good time for all of us. Uh, yeah, today is going to be, I hope, an interesting and enlightening conversation, and we will try to make it a conversation um, because this is really a dialogue that we should all be having, uh, especially given that we're six months from the time that ChatGPT was launched and the world changed just a little bit. Uh, today is really about thinking through and looking for opportunities to potentially deploy some different ways of engaging students uh, and saving time for ourselves with these different teaching and learning approaches that we may want to embrace. Uh, we'll have a very, very brief look at what we do at Noodle Factory, and I'll just give you uh, the kind of the potted information of, of what we do. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we're piloting with the University of London, and what we provide is an AI-powered teaching assistant. So we have more of an educator-first approach uh, around engaging students. The things that we often measure from a student perspective are the level of engagement, the, the amount of engagement, and what we're looking for is to see, are we uh, able to gauge improvements in student assessments? Um, all of that in, in the furtherance of what's called mastery, uh, ensuring that students get into sort of a flow where they're regularly able to score 80, 90% on the assessments that we have in the, in the system. And we test to see how that shows up uh, in other work and especially into the grade book. And we can get into that a bit more if we have time. Um, I should mention that what we're going to do in just the 
next short amount of time, we often engage in half day and one day workshops where we get very hands on and we actually try to deploy some chat based learning. Um, Tim and I have spoken about that. If there's if there's a sufficient level of interest, we can certainly do that. In fact, we've talked about potentially doing that as early as the 15th of June uh, in London on campus. So uh, if you're interested, definitely reach out and we can uh, extend this conversation into one of those half day or full day workshops. Today, though, uh, it's a bit of an ambitious set of questions that we're going to try to work through. Uh, we're going to try to ask and answer these questions. Uh, number one, especially just as a bit of background, in case you haven't spent a lot of time playing around with BARD or Bing or ChatGPT, we're just going to give a working definition of what is a GPT and why should I care, especially in education. And in that sense, what's the current state of AI in education? Uh, this is a very fast moving space. Uh, if you believe the headlines, it's either the best time or the worst time to be in education. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle, and we'll take a close look at that. And then we'll get into the really the purpose for today. Is chat-based learning really a thing? And the short answer is yes. Uh, it's a longstanding pedagogical uh, approach, and we'll give you a little bit of a history lesson on that, and then look at exactly what it is in the context of conversational and generative AI, and how you can consider that uh, potentially bringing that into your own practice. And then we'll talk about some of the near term risks of which there are many, as well as opportunities. Um, there are certainly a lot of opportunities, but we obviously need to be cautious and, and think through any downside risks that might present themselves. So with that in mind, and by the way, as we go through, you heard Tim say we've got the Q&A panel active. Please feel free to ask those questions. We'll stop periodically and answer questions as we can. But also after today, if there are questions that we don't have time to get to, we'll make sure to follow up with you and to answer those questions. So very, very briefly, let's define what a GPT is and why you should care. Certainly, if you're like me, your inbox is flooded with information about all of the different capabilities and, and pitfalls of what is broadly called conversational or generative AI. Those two things have become synonymous. They're actually different things. But a GPT, and I'm going to use the examples of OpenAI's GPT-3, which is what was launched back on November 30th, 2022, and now GPT-4. Uh, this is an acronym or an acrostic that really only a developer could love. It stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Not exactly an elegant way to <laughs> it just doesn't exactly roll off the tongue but it is very descriptive and if you just look at what that is telling us it's it is very uh, informative it generates new content based on pre-trained information in this case we're largely talking about text-based information or language-based information uh, the english language in the case of open ai and it transforms that information into something new based on something that existed previously. So GPT-3 and 4 really just speak to the fact that these are the third and fourth iterations of what's called a large language model or LLM. Uh, in the case of GPT-3, uh, this is information that was scraped from relatively trusted sources on the internet. So think Wikipedia, think open source journal articles, open source textbooks. Um, works of literature that are in the public domain, really anything that's relatively trusted that could be used to spot patterns in the way that we use language as humans. And this is a, an oversimplification. GPT-3, as an example, the deep learning algorithms that explored the English, English language, about seven-ish uh, seven gigabytes of information, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's all text, uh, that these patterns were reve revealed through these deep learning algorithms to the tune of about 175 billion parameters. And so the generative part of what's going on here, if we ask the question, well, what exactly is generative AI? Again, it's a term that does serve to describe what's going on. When we say generative, we're talking about generating new things based on old information or existing information, uh, producing content, uh, maybe code, it could be audio these days. We probably have all heard of the very famous, um, maybe they're called deep fakes in some quarters, but uh, really interesting and creative uses of audio 
based on uh, voice samples and music samples, images, text, simulations, videos, all sorts of things that can be generated by AI. And if you're new to this space, probably the simplest way to describe this is through a picture that was created based on a prompt that I gave it. Dolly is a generative AI tool that's also owned by OpenAI. I put in a very simple prompt here, dogs playing chess. And if you look at that photo, or that it's not really a photo, it's an AI generated image. Yes, there is a dog. As a matter of fact, there's another dog that you can't see behind the graphic. It is dogs playing chess. But on closer inspection, it's a little bit strange. Yes, that looks like a chess board and those look like chess pieces, but they're a little bit mangled. That's kind of the way this, this generative AI works today. Uh, and I should say that there are many, many different types of companies that are in this space. Noodle Factory is technically a company that is in the generative AI space as well, although we are exclusively focused on education. But this is sort of the Wild West right now. Uh, there are thousands of companies that have sprung up over the last, call it two years or so, that are technically in this generative AI space. And there's a, a process that's going on now that is colloquially, colloquially blah, largely called, let me, <laughs> I got my tongue tied there, largely called AI washing or generative AI washing that's happening where companies will say, yeah, we're in the generative AI space because that's the thing to do these days, whether it's to attract customers or to attra attract investment. There's there's a lot of AI washing going on. Um, so as you consider where and how you might want to research this or try some things, uh, look and see what is actually the generative capability that's being undertaken. Quite frankly, even deeper than that, what's the AI that's being used? That's probably a conversation for another day, but suffice it to say that there is a, a, a lot of action, a lot of development, a lot of really interesting re research that's going on in this space. The last thing that I'll say about GPT, specifically GPT-4, is if you've read some of the technical information or even the non-technical, uh, more accessible information, if you will, about the capabilities of GPT-4, a couple of really interesting things that stand out are its ability to essentially ace standardized tests. So this comes directly from the GPT-4 technical report that uh, was released along with the launch of GPT-4, this fourth iteration of the large language model. And I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things on this uh, on this chart. Notice GPT 3.5, which is what we got access to back in November. Uh, a couple of exams, so the uniform bar exam, which is the exam if you're going to be um, a lawyer who passes the bar in the United States, you have to pass this exam. GPT 3.5 performed in the 10th percentile, meaning that nine out of 10 uh, prospective lawyers who took this exam did better than GPT 3.5. But look at the difference just a few months makes. GPT-4 performed in the 90th percentile, meaning that it performed better than nine out of 10 prospective lawyers. That's probably the most ex uh, uh, impressive example, the most dramatic example, but this is a very long list. I'm just giving you a short sample of the exams that this, uh, this model took. Things like the LSAT, things like the, the GRE. So, not quite as impressive, but still amazing. And it draws into question another topic that we could spend a lot of time on, which is what is the future of assessment? How do we rethink assessment? How do we get more authentic in the way that we uh, both produce and deploy and allow students to participate in assessments, potentially more so as a process of learning rather than simply for a score or a grade? So, again, a rabbit hole that we could go down on another day. But I introduced that to you to say, this is something that, pick your analogy, the toothpaste is out of the tube, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, we are in an area that is moving exceptionally fast. And so we need to be aware of it, especially in education. We need to be sensitized to what the current state of AI and education is today, and where is that going, very importantly. 
So let me just stop right there and, and see if we do have any any questions just about that basic understanding that working definition of what a GPT is because that will lead into some of the conversation we have about the possibilities and chat based learning as a pedagogical approach. Tim, how are we looking on questions? So nothing specifically around uh, that, Jim. I think there's, um, I mean, there is some questions around kind of how different exams, uh, how, sorry, different qualifications are assessed. Uh, so for example, yes. is the bar exam based on MCQs and obviously like what kind of impact that might have on uh, the way in which these tools are used uh, to, to for learners? Or uh, the other one is specifically more about um, the, the University of London and, and the nature of assessment, uh, the impact that it's having on assessment. I mean, um, if you'd like, I mean, we can speak more, more broadly about that if you'd like to. Um, but it seems like everyone who's in the meeting has a general understanding of GPT in, in this. Okay. I, I, I'm making a massive assumption there. OK, no, that's perfect. And I'll just say one more thing about this, because I think I'm really passionate about this particular aspect of of AI. I think it's kind of bringing to the surface something that's been bubbling for a while, which is the need to develop more authentic assessments and to be more constructively aligned in education as particularly you know learning outcomes are we are we actually moving towards the right learning outcomes are we assessing for learning outcomes uh, and so i think it's a healthy conversation uh, but i'll give you a funny example from this list if you actually read the technical report if you go way way down on the list of exams that gpt4 did really well on one of them was the master sommelier exam which is the the written exam is uh, very very technical uh, dealing with uh, all sorts of growing regions of wines and food pairings and whiskeys and there's all sorts of things in the exam that you need to know that are very fact driven but obviously the one thing that gpt4 will never be able to do at least not in, in our life in our lifetimes i would perceive is the uh, the serving <laughs> the serving exam and the tasting exam so we're not quite there yet so and i suppose that gets into the notion of this statement that uh uh, Lee Kai Fu made a number of years ago in an interview on CNBC when asked, is AI coming for my job? Well, the good news is that for most of us, AI is not going to replace us, but it is the humans who don't know how to use AI that might get replaced. And so I think the fact that you're here probably says you're one of those people that is curious. Maybe you're looking to implement AI and the current state of AI in education sort of looks like this. Um, these are short to medium term AI use cases that we could probably go out and right now begin to at least do some research around, maybe do some piloting as we're doing with the University of London. Um, you know, these are roles that could be ripe for automation, uh, not taking jobs away, but providing assistance to educators and uh, specifically teaching assistance, which is what we provide. But if you think about career coaching, um, doing research assistance, and then the tasks that these AIs can undertake, effectively making us superhuman in a way, uh, you know, being able to take on things like essay grading. Uh, of course, there's a big conversation about what happens to the essay in this sort of uh, generative AI environment, uh, but doing things like student sentiment analysis, uh, generating knowledge bases. We'll take a, a, a very quick look at that today. There's all sorts of things that are very time consuming, potentially very error prone when humans do it. Things that we may not necessarily like to do, which are ripe for automation and the cost of doing that, taking on that automation or, or handing these, these things over to an AI is plummeting. Uh, and so that's good news for all of us because I know uh, I, I would certainly like to have more assistance in my day job, uh, and I would reckon that you would probably like the same. So that brings us to this question of what about chat based learning? Is this really a thing? And the short answer is yes. So chat based learning, if you have a look at the literature and I encourage you to do this, it really goes all the way back to the very first chat bots back in the 1960s. Uh, in fact, you can go further back than that. You could go back to the days of B.F. Skinner, who envisioned a, what he called a teaching machine. Uh, in fact, this, this is something that was imagined more, it was a bit more science fiction-y back in the 1920s and 1930s. But even then, there were educational psychologists who were really thinking about 
how could we automate the process of tutoring? Uh, these were largely behaviorists. So B.F. Skinner very famously is a behaviorist. And so it was about reinforcement learning and he had, had this teaching machine in mind. So you take that with a little bit of a pinch of salt and you move forward to today. He, he could never have imagined what we have today in terms of the ability to blend in what is called chat based learning in the literature with our broader digital pedagogy. So just to very quickly define that so digital pedagogy is also something that's pretty well represented in the literature basically this is about the application of digital technologies in our teaching and learning so that's a very broad way of categorizing a lot of things that we do typically um, dp shows up in blended learning approaches and of course that has been the norm for the last three years uh, very importantly Chat-based learning as a subcategory of digital pedagogy also has now its modern roots in constructivist theories of instruction. Um, and this speaks directly to students becoming more self-directed in their learning and effectively taking control of when, how, and what they engage in, largely through conversation uh, as if they were engaging a human tutor. And to, I guess, call back on history yet again, another uh, behavioral psychologist, uh, Benjamin Bloom. Of course, we're all we're very familiar with uh, Bloom's taxonomy and potentially you're familiar with Bloom's two sigma problem. Uh, Bloom's two sigma problem, uh, essentially the way that he laid that out said, if we could provide high quality one-to-one -one tutoring to every student, we would see better results and that would show up in the form of mastery of subjects. And he did prove that, but the economics of that, the logistics of that proved to be untenable. And when you think about it, that's logical. We don't have enough educators to begin with, much less being able to provide high quality one-to-one -one tutoring to every student. However, that is potentially what we have today. And certainly that's one of my dreams is to, to change uh, what's often called the unit economics of education, where we can provide better, call it high quality one-to-one -one tutoring to more students at a lower cost per capita, uh, and, and give more students the opportunity to be comfortable, confident, and successful, and to achieve mastery in the subjects of their choice, and to see that show up in the broader learning environments that they're engaged with. And chat-based learning is a way to potentially make that real. So what, I want to give you some guidance around chat-based learning, some, uh, I guess, some design principles around chat-based learning. And then I've got a rubric. Oh, it's not really a rubric. It's more of a taxonomy that I'll share with you. Uh, and we'll, by the way, share this content with you later that can kind of give you a sense of if you're thinking about where and how and if chat-based learning could be something that benefits you. It's sort of a decision process that you can go through to see where and how that impact could be felt by you and your students. But I think the first thing to remember is when we think chat-based learning, there might be the temptation as a new shiny object just to think about a novel delivery of content, you know, a different way of, of having students access content. We need to be a little more thoughtful about how we use chat-based learning. So rather than just replicating content in chat or even replicating the lesson plans that we have in chat, think of this as another tool in your toolkit. And so what is the way that you can maybe in a focused fashion deliver the content potentially that you don't have time to in the classroom? That's a, that's a design principle that we'll get into in just a moment. The other thing to remember is that, especially now that we've got generative AI tools at our fingertips and more and more purpose-built tools for educators that leverage generative AI, that leverage conversational AI, we need to be really comfortable curating our content via chat-based learning. This is an additional means of communicating. We could also say engaging with our students wherever they happen to be. That could be geographically, but I tend to think of that more digitally. What's the channel that a student might prefer? Is that Microsoft Teams? 
Is that Google Classroom? Is that their phone? Is that their laptop via a browser? So what are all of the channels that we can curate our content and provide that availability to, to students so that we broaden the, I guess, broaden the reach that we have is another way to think of it, or broaden the, uh, uh, the, the channels of communication to those students so that we have a better than average shot of keeping those students engaged. We all know student engagement, generally speaking around the world, is a problem and it's gotten uh, paradoxically worse uh, potentially as a result of the pandemic because of the digital overload that many students have felt uh, after having been online for so long. The last couple of things that I'd share with you before we uh, take a look at an example of chat-based learning and then get into some of those design principles is I think on a positive note, this is an opportunity for us to think of creative ways to push the boundaries of what traditional chat-based learning has looked like. And I'm not talking about all the way back to the 1960s and 70s. I'm talking about the fairly recent days of the early 20, uh, 2010s, you know, right up to the pandemic, thinking about the use of chat-based learning and leveraging tools like maybe ChatGPT, maybe BARD, uh, or using tools that incorporate different types of generative AI to help students collaborate, maybe to moderate student activities, to allow them to do different things and express creativity, uh, to move beyond some of the maybe mundane work that uh, potentially was expected in years past, but now we've got the ability to try different things and use generative AI as a part of our teaching and learning. It's been said, and I know it's a little bit of a cliche these days, but we're kind of experiencing our calculator moment, um, and I'm showing my age there, but uh, maybe it's for you, it's the spreadsheet moment, uh, whatever that tech, or maybe it's the Google moment, whatever that technology was that when you were coming up and potentially when you were a student disrupted teaching and learning, we're, we're going through that again. And it's, it's not an overstatement or an exaggeration to say that November 30th, 2022, when ChatGPT was released to the world, it really did, it was one of those threshold concepts or threshold moments. It will never be able to unsee that. We'll never be able to see AI in exactly the same way again because of that moment in time. Now, let me shift gears a little bit, and this is by no means uh, a commercial break. I'm not trying to do an advert for Walter. Uh, but just by way of example, I wanted to just introduce you to what we're piloting with the University of London. So Walter is our avatar here, um, and this is our chat-based learning environment. It's a platform that starts with the educator and incorporates the engagement with the student. And I'll give you some examples on how we're doing that. Um, one question that often comes up is, why the noodly hair? <laughs> What's the name Noodle Factory all about? Um, in many cultures, the noodle is uh, synonymous with brain or thinking. You might have heard people say, uh, let me noodle on that. Uh, and this occurs in English language. It occurs in German language. Uh, but yeah, that's that's where we're going for there. Is, what we're going for there is the, the thought process and, and generating new thoughts, generating new ideas. So Walter, um, what Walter is able to do is from a student perspective, we really focus on student engagement and learning. So here we are trying to replicate using existing content that one-to-one -one AI tutoring or one-to-one -one tutoring that might occur uh, between a human and a student, but to moderate that using AI. So here students can go in, they can uh, explore content, they can go down guided tutorials, uh, which include things like videos and other rich media. Uh, but they can also just explore uh, so students can ask questions they can also extend that into formative assessments today we do tend to operate in the realm of formative assessments rather than summative assessments and so here students can uh, take these formative assessments and use them in the process of learning as many times as they would like uh, we have had some of our universities that we work with engage in research around this 
uh, over a period of, uh, of a few terms, and there are measurable uh, positive outcomes that they have seen. These are peer-reviewed studies. In fact, uh, you can we can send you a couple of these research papers. One of them was an action research paper applying chat-based learning uh, really to test to see does it improve student engagement and uh, student performance in the in the form of assessments and the short answer is yes limited amount of data at this point because it's a fairly new space but glad to share with you the data that we do have uh, via that uh, that study and another um, from a teaching perspective so i mentioned we really do start with the educator and so here the metric that we're focused on is primarily time savings this is a self-reported metric. We don't really have a way to calculate time savings automatically. However, here again, we have consistently seen, um, you know, a dozen hours or so each week per educator that's saved, largely from offloading things like answering FAQs. Uh, a lot of that is on Slack or Teams or WhatsApp. Uh, and, and the big one is marking of assessments, marking of formative assessments. There's a paradox that when we talk about formative assessments, generally students want more, but the more formative assessments we introduce to students, the more hours that we have to spend providing feedback on those formative assessments. And so this gives you the option, even where the student is generating open text answers or maybe creative responses to questions, they get instantaneous feedback on that. So we can look at that a little more closely in just a moment. The, the origins of these tutorials, these formative assessments, it's all in the content that you're already using. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that. So I was playing around earlier today, uh, and what you're seeing here is the student experience in a browser. And I took uh, a document of mine that I've got on research methodologies. And this is, this is actually a course that I'm putting together right now. And this is just a very brief overview of different research method methodologies. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag that in, that document, it's just a Word document, and you can use any Word, uh, any text-based document, any website. And you can see really quickly, I get a summary of that information. If that were a longer document, I could section it off, but I'll go ahead and just do the whole document. And now I wanna get uh, a clean summary of what's in that document. So there might be you know, stray information in there. There might be footnotes that I may not necessarily want. I just want the core information in that document. And here I can specify whether I want a brief summary, a balanced summary. In this case, I want a detailed summary. And there you go, I've got a, I've got a summary of that document. I could take, as you can with many other tools, you can take multiple documents and summarize those. If it was a lecture transcript, I could summarize that, clean that up. And now I'm ready as a student to come in and begin asking questions. You know, a common question here, what's the difference between phenomenology and ethnography? I get a quick answer. So now th this is an oversimplification of the type of tutorial that you might wanna have with this type of subject. Uh, I might actually want to guide students down a specified guided tutorial, and I can set that up uh, with the document that I dragged in earlier. But you know, maybe I'm a student that I'm saying, well, you know, how can I mix phenomenology with quantitative research? And the obvious answer is probably going to be mixed methods. But you'll notice that it says, hey, I don't have the context for that because I dragged in a, a very short document. But it does attempt to give an answer from the information that was in that short document that I uploaded. So I think the bottom line here is if we're talking about chat-based learning, one of the things that you want to consider is, and, and I, I, this is a cautionary tale, you don't want to spend a ton more time trying to go and develop an entire set of curriculum specifically for your chat-based learning approach. This should be additive, it should be complementary, to whatever you're doing in the classroom, wherever the classroom happens to be, online, um, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, I want this to be completely complementary. And the easiest and the best way that we have found to do that 
is through the use of that existing content. So all of us would have slides, we'd have lecture transcripts, we probably have lecture notes. So all the things, the, the little digital scraps that we're using to, to teach our courses, that is the source material for chat-based learning, at least in the, in the way that I'm demonstrating it here today. So that, that sort of begs the question then, if these sorts of tools are out there, these purpose-built tools that even if I'm not completely comfortable with the underlying technology, if I can take and reuse the content, reuse the curriculum that I'm deploying in my classroom today, what if I want to try this? So how could I consider trying this in my practice? Well, there, there are three design considerations that I wanted to share with you. And this, this really comes from both practical engagement with educators around the world, but it's also kind of grounded in the current the contemporary literature around chat-based learning so let's take a look at this when you're considering to deploy this type of of approach number one is really think about this and i mentioned this earlier as a way to expand your reach um, if you are overwhelmed with the number of queries that you're getting if you're overwhelmed with the amount of time you're spending on more admin functions rather than the teaching and learning aspect of what you're doing. Think of this as a way to expand the reach and the interest and the impact of what you do in your teaching. On the flip side with the student, this is potentially a way to really uh, engage and increase the knowledge, the understanding and the application of learning by students. That does require some thought, so that's not as simple as dragging and dropping. But I'll show you in a moment, there's some tips and tricks around lesson planning, specifically for chat-based learning, that can help you with a thought process to try to really focus on ultimately getting to a high level of understanding, getting students to demonstrate that understanding, and then generally in the wider world, getting students to demonstrate the application of what they've learned, which is obviously the ultimate thing that we're going for, the transfer of the learning out into the wider world. Design consideration number two, and this is a touchy one, it's a tricky one, but there's already too much content for us to cover, especially if you're using a textbook and there's not enough time to cover it. <laughs> and yet we feel like we're bound and determined to get through the content. Using chat-based learning really, if, if we're gonna use it well, it forces us to think a little bit differently about how we potentially subdivide and narrow the focus of our content in the traditional class, right? So even if that's asynchronous, compared to what we provide students in a chat-based learning environment. So what that would mean is if we have content that's potentially valuable and useful, but we know we're not going to have time to cover it in the class, so to speak, maybe that's a great place for chat-based learning. So for students who might want to explore that, um, as potentially optional or additive uh, types of engagement with curriculum, that's a great place to park that. Or even if we've got required content reading assessments, maybe as a way to try to reduce the amount of time that you have to spend directly on that, chat-based learning can be a way to extend the reach. And here we get into the need for students to be enabled and, and to be empowered and in some cases directed around what it means to be self-directed in their learning to take control of their learning to show them to and to prompt them and to give them examples of how they can explore the content in this way using chat-based learning and for students who are motivated to do that how that could lead to better understanding and ultimately better performance both in the class, but in the application of the knowledge that they're gaining. Finally, and this is a big one, I, I think the it, it sounds simple, but I think this is maybe the most important design consideration. When you take a step back and you think about your own teaching and learning approaches, how can you strengthen the constructive alignment uh, with your learning outcomes? Uh, and to be honest, when could chat-based learning just get in the way? 
Um, as, as someone who has a vested interest in seeing chat-based learning become more of a thing, I realize that it is not appropriate for every situation. And so we need to be very cognizant of the fact that there are some times when chat-based learning is going to be a burden, it's going to get in the way, maybe for a particular discipline it's not appropriate, potentially for a, a group of students it's not appropriate. So look at the pros and cons of that. And if you think about that from your own practice, your own situation, where do you see opportunities where just-in-time delivery or uh, delivery across multiple channels could complement what you're doing in your teaching and learning via chat-based learning? Okay, now th that's a ton of things to take on board in an unfairly short amount of time. Uh, those of you who might have joined before we uh, got into this subject, uh, I mentioned right at the outset, this is this part of the conversation is actually something that we get into typically in a half day workshop or in some cases a full day workshop. Um, if there is sufficient interest, we can actually get hands on. You can build your own chat based learning approach in a workshop, and uh, that's something that Tim and I have talked about potentially doing on June 15th. Uh, the timing around that might be a little bit tricky, but if you're interested in doing something like that, please do reach out to Tim and let him know, and we can certainly arrange that. And we, we would do that at uh, probably in a hybrid environment, but for any of you who are in the London area, we could do that uh, on campus on June 15th. There are a couple of things I'm gonna share with you um, post webinar today that uh, you might find useful if you're thinking about chat-based learning. One of them is a much more detailed um, chart that will help you to think about the design considerations of chat-based learning. And it's meant to try to get you to assess the degree of difficulty in repurposing content and repurposing your teaching and learning approaches, and then the impact. So the way you read this is, so knowledge acquisition, and I guess you could say this roughly equates to a portion of Bloom's taxonomy. Knowledge acquisition is pretty easy. Uh, application is significantly more difficult, but the impact, if we get that right, is significantly higher. So as you run your eyes down that list, things like personalization, uh, giving students the opportunity to develop mastery in a subject, so these are all really standalone areas that you can discreetly pursue in chat-based learning environments, but they do have sort of a knock-on effect in a positive way. The more of these areas you're able to thoughtfully plan into your chat-based learning environment, the more benefit students will get and the more likely they are to come back and re-engage with that content, and that will show up in the broader classroom and broader performance. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, let me just stop right there because the last thing that we want to cover is to talk a little bit about the risks, but also talk about maybe some short term opportunities and to give you some resources uh, before we end today. But Tim, let me just check and see if we yeah, have any questions. We, we do. We've got we've got quite a few and they, they're, they're quite uh, quite wide ranging. So okay. I mean, if you think this might be a nice opportunity to kind of go through some of them and, and give your your feedback. I'm not expecting you necessarily to be able to answer all of them because, you know, I mean, some of them are, quite, you know, they're they're big, big conversations to have. But I suppose um, there are some questions around kind of the the how, how what their impact might look like um, on different professions, which again, I think is, you know, kind of an ongoing subject. Some professions will be more impact impacted than others. And I think uh, in, in ways that you know we haven't predicted i think um, right. so going for another question um how do we motivate students to learn content when content can be retrieved uh what will we be assessing it seems that it's an opportunity to assess um but understanding uh without kind of changing assessment could be a big challenge uh you know what as as this becomes more part of students and and indeed you know everyone's lives uh what are going to be the sorts of skills that need to be as assessed and, and and strived for and you know will they change obviously that's a big one um you know uh I, I suppose you know this this kind of ties into it about how uh some that there, there could be a loss of skills um when there's reliance on 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 ai and you know can we 
can we really truly say that it will provide a better experience? You know, a, a, a good example would be sort of translation, for example. Mm. Yes, yeah, so I've got a few more, really, but I've, I've just really important. You, so I'll let you answer those and then I'll move on. Yeah, I think I've so I, let's consider those because all of those are both challenges, but they also represent opportunities to do some things differently. So maybe let's talk about those in the context of uh, maybe even short term experiments or research or uh, little trials that you might want to do to think about each of those things. Um, uh, let me come back to that in a moment because I, I think I'll tee that up in terms of the opportunities that we've got. Um, if we very briefly just hit on some of the risks, again, this is a topic that we could spend the entire hour on, much more than that as a matter of fact. But I will say, you know, one of the things that we've got right now that is quite concerning is there is a significant misalignment of incentives and this is not just the profit incentive that many of these companies have it's the incentives that we have in education too so it's maybe in a positive way thinking of it glass half full it's a chance to rethink the alignment of incentives that we have and i'm i'm going to use an intentionally extreme example of this which i'm sure none of you fall prey to but in some schools, I'll just put it that way, there, there is the incentive to go and teach to the test and the incentives are aligned around student marks. Uh, now that's an extreme example, but if our incentives are aligned there, then AI might only accelerate that misalignment of incentives. So the, the misalignment there is clearly that we're not assessing learning, we're assessing the ability to recall information. and that my, my fear is specifically there is that for a period of time we may fall into that trap where we continue to ex, uh, assess students ability to recall information when this is a real opportunity to think about what is that authentic assessment that allows us to assess whether or not learning has occurred um, and I will be the first to admit that becomes very difficult in this type of a space so we're, where we've got the ability to go and generate now text but in the future audio video I mean audio is already here but really credible video um, other types of assessment authentic assessment that we might ask students to do if that can be generated by an AI we have to find some sort of middle ground I don't think it's as easy as saying let's go back to pencil and paper let's do everything in a proctored environment in an exam room it's i mean that's that's not the direction that we want to go what is the innovation that maybe the ai itself can allow us to undertake in order to to make that a reality and if you just focus in on education this conversation is happening in every sector so education is just one of the types of conversations that are ha happening um, if you're interested in some of the topics around this, I, I do have some resources that I would recommend to you. I think if you just want to go and do a search on AI safety, this is a topic in the literature that is exploding uh, for good reason. And so if you go and look at the topic of AI safety, it really cover, covers a wide range of issues and opportunities. If you would like to take a look at some of the resources that are more in the business press, here are a few that I have found really helpful. Um, and when I recommend these, I might run the risk of sounding like an AI skeptic. Clearly I'm not because I'm in this space, but I'm an AI realist. And so things like rebooting AI, uh, Gary Marcus is somebody who has developed AI platforms and he takes a very sober look at what in all sectors we need to do uh, related to AI. Uh, Vasa Smil, Smil has a great book, uh, not necessarily specifically around AI, but it really just it gets into what's happening with a lot of the underlying technologies that we're becoming reliant upon. And speaking of that, the alignment problem is an excellent piece of work that talks about the need to realign incentives. And then ironically, probably one of the best things that you might want to read is written by Sam Altman, who is the CEO and co-founder of OpenAI. Uh, this was written a few years ago, but it's his kind of manifesto on how can we introduce AI for good. Um, 
Now, I think the billions of dollars that Microsoft has invested in OpenAI could have shifted his opinion a little bit, but it's it's a very good starting point to understand some of the problems, but also opportunities related to AI. Here's the last thing that I'll share with you just in terms of opportunities, kind of going back to some of those questions. I think in the really short term, some of the tools that you could look to harness and practice with and maybe get some insights around cover these areas. Uh, virtual tutoring, teaching assistants, uh, design assistants, authoring tools, language coaching, certainly a lot of the mundane tasks around document editing and management. And then from a teaching perspective, think about how you can introduce chat-based learning or just generative AI very broadly to try to get students to think more critically or be more uh, media literate. Uh, maybe use this as a different type of flipped classroom approach engaging in Socratic dialogue, having the AI drive the Socratic dialogue. So all sorts of different things that you can do. Collaboration. Uh, so this is a, a capability that we've recently introduced, an AI moderating group study, promoting collaboration among students at a project level. So lots and lots of things that you can do here. We're that's out been, of time. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry, I was going to say that's been really, really fascinating. I really appreciate you trying to kind of get as much in as yeah. possible. Um, I really, really appreciate it. There's a, there's a couple of kind of questions um, that I just want to kind of address really quickly off off, yes. off the bat because. Uh, but but what I will say to everyone is that you know we this is an ongoing discussion, and I think the hope would be that we'd have more events where you know we might have a more of a, a discussion based approach to this. But I, I think. Thank you for, again for, for coming. I, I, there's there's a couple of questions about kind of how do you decide on the, the avatar, for example, in terms mm. of kind of equality, diversity and inclusion for, for engaging diverse students uh, and another one. And, and I think, you know, it's probably important to say that th there is a, a, the ability to kind of change uh, the, 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 the the avatar essentially um, with, with the uh, and I think it reminds me of a, a, a conversation with a colleague from Open University who was suggesting that they they spent a lot of time thinking about a particular name mm. depending on the kind of uh, their students and I think they wanted to go for something like gender neutral and 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 you know there's a lot of considerations around the way it's presented um I, there was also a question about kind of um you know the equitability of, of a product like this and i think for for our approach at the University of London it's always been a case that you know we'd want to ensure that uh students had the, the you know uh equitable access to this kind of um, resource because uh, you know as I think you've, you've, you've mentioned uh, uh, you know that that's also going to be a challenge of of you know the people that are going to be have access to these kinds of things um, there are there are there are a load of more questions but what I will do is is in my response when I provide all of the content uh, and the recording um, I, I might include some of those questions uh, and perhaps Jim you and I can can provide a collective response to those uh, and then continue the conversation uh, in the future. Um, yes, I don't know if there's anything you want to kind of sign off with, Jim, before we go. Yeah, just uh, on the screen, you might see here if you're keen to give this a try, um, you can start using Walter today. So there's a URL there. There's a QR code that goes to that URL. So there's no obligation. You can just sign up and give it a try. If you're a part of University of London, um, we can get you in up under the instance that's already there for the pilot. But if you're from another institution, we can sign you up and get you started and you can um, have a play around and we can get somebody to help you if you'd like to get some more information on repurposing some course content that you might have. Um. And again, like once again, thanks ever so much, Jim, for for attending. Um, and thank you very much for ever so much for everyone who's come to this. Apologies uh, about the technical issue at the beginning. Uh, we'll 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 solve that for the next one um, but uh, that's all from us today um, look forward to getting the emails through uh, with all the rest of the content and uh, we'll speak to you soon thanks very much bye bye thank you